Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Elseworlds Exchange. Uh, I'm excited because it's uh, the first, like, full-on conversation, creator conversation that we've had since I promised we wouldn't do this anymore. It's Jim <laughs> Zub, everybody. It's <laughs> what, what, you're saying I break the rules? Is you this bro, how this I, works? I break the rules for people that I... We're not doing I, creator conversations, but this this guy, he's just... But, ah, we're going to have Jim. <laughs> we can't You know what? It. I want to talk to Jim. All right. Um, <laughs> well, cause every time we run into each other, I'm like, we should just chat for like a good hour. And then right? I, and it's like, you're going, I'm coming. It's like not, work. you know, like the last time I literally saw you was on a street corner. Yeah, we were walking. I, you were walking <laughs> on the street, New York Comic Con after hours. And it yeah. was sort of like, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, we're all here for the convention. But it's weird because New York's such a strange show. Like San Diego, the entire city is overtaken by comics. Completely. So running into people every hundred feet outside the show is not a surprise but for some reason in new york you're supposed to leave the convention center and vaporize no one's That's right. supposed to find each other you know <laughs> yeah. so seeing you on the street was just like what are you doing here <laughs> it's, yeah, like, well, no, it's weird yeah. and, and or it's like uh, it's a lot more like i bumped into natives of new york at mm -hmm. new york comic-con outside of the convention right and their new york mode goes in <laughs> you know, like I saw uh, Joe Casada one time out, like in the world right. during New York Comic Con, and he—you could see this. Like, I'm not Joe Casada right now <laughs> at this like, moment. <laughs> please, don't. like I am New Yorker. Get the hell away yeah, from me! Yeah, yeah, uh, that's and, and awesome. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Flip Same the thing. switch, right? <laughs> exactly. But with San Diego, it's like, hey, hey, yeah, hey, and yeah. I can say that because I've been there now finally. You got to tune the dials differently depending on where you are. I had no idea. Like I, I'd never been to San Diego. I went this past year. You and I had a great, like several conversations yeah. broken up over a period of <laughs> several hours. Uh, and, uh, and, and I didn't believe the hype. I was like, no, this is a really dope ass convention. Like, oh, and yeah, it does take over like these surrounding areas and it, stuff like the that. The entire downtown core is bonkers. And, and the discoveries, you know, every time I go to San Diego Comic-Con, I think I have, I have like a rise and fall of my attitude. Like, I'm like, this is the right. greatest thing ever. And then like, I can't <laughs> deal with it. It's too much. Why am I doing this? And then near the end, it'll rally. And I'll be like, yeah. no. And, and I always tell people, they say, you know, so what are you going to the show for this year? And I go, I don't know. And they go, what do you mean? <laughs> well, it's to promote my stuff and it's to meet people, whatever. But it's rare that I have like a singular meeting or this is the, the thing I know ahead of time. Yeah. Usually what will happen is over the course of that week, there will be one or two interactions that I'll have that I never planned, that I didn't think were going to happen. I get a text or I run into someone or a conversation happens or someone says, oh, you got to meet so-and-so. Yeah. And after it happens in that moment, I go, oh, that's why I came exactly that that's, was the moment that was what i was waiting for i just didn't know i was waiting for that's the yeah. reason to go especially yeah. if you have any like in because sure it's it, it's the reason like yeah like you said yeah there's, there's... and it's pure kind of networking in that sense and yeah. it's hard to explain that to people because you know obviously if you're an artist or a writer or something you're trying to aspiring trying to get in you don't want to say to people you should just go because something will happen you're like yeah but this is costing me money and time <laughs> yeah this is like effort. a yeah this is an uh, investment uh, hope and a dream is not really uh uh you know the fuel that is going to get my fire going and you're like no. and yeah and yeah right you know part of it, it there's this weird thing that happens when you go to conventions when you're on the circuit or whatever you want to call it yeah. where people will see you and then they'll see you multiple times and then a familiarity builds up even if they don't know you Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there's this weird breach that happens where suddenly people just say your name or, or I'll be in a mixed company and then I'll say, Oh, I'm Jim's up. And everyone goes, we know. And you're like, what? How do you know? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Like that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Like I was at, um, Halcon last weekend, Halifax, yes. uh, Nova Scotia. It was great. Uh, I actually lived in Halifax like 20 years ago, uh, working at an animation studio. So walking around the downtown corn, it's like all the buildings have changed, but some little spots are the exact same. So it's like mm -hmm. freaky and nostalgic and all that stuff. And we're in the green room and uh, John Scalzi's there, like the you know number one New York Times bestselling author and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I sit down at the table to have my lunch and we're chatting a little bit. And I go to introduce myself and, and he, I said, you know, I'm, I'm Jim Zub, I'm an author. And he goes, Oh, fantasy guy. And I was like, yeah, what? Like how, <laughs> why is that even a thing? Like, how did that even happen? Right. How, how did um, that intersect? How does John Scalzi know yeah. not only my name, but also like what wheelhouse I'm in? Like you know? I, I'm supposed to be turning up the witty so that you remember me. That's the part we're supposed to be at in this interaction. Right. Yeah. Now, no, he's, yeah. Just con he's confirming what he already knows. Yeah. Right. Which is weird. It was great. You know, and we yeah. had a really nice weekend my wife and I, and, and we had some great interactions. We got to hang out with uh, Troy Little and Brenda. Uh, they are amazing. Troy's the artist on uh, Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu that I'm yep. doing at Oni that is launching next month. And that is going to be 
friggin' amazing. I know I'm going yeah. into promo mode here, but I can't help it. <laughs> uh, the book's so good. The book's so amazing. Like all the stuff that we kind of tuned, that the way we figured out how to work together so well on Rick and Morty versus Dungeons and Dragons now yeah. just feels like it's turned up to 11. Like we're just on fire on this thing. And I think uh, it's going to be memorable. We've got so many cool moments built in there. And um, yeah, 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 it's just going to be a crazy good book. Now, is and this... I've been just itching to get this out. So. Yeah. Now you you uh is this the creature from the opening credits or is this just so is it tangentially connected? Yeah, the, I... the the concept of pitching it sort of became this multi tiered thing where I I knew about that you know obviously that opening credit moment with Cthulhu ish monster there and I thought oh it'd be fun if you could do some sort of a story with that but yeah. my original idea was not built off the back of that it ended up incorporating and threading its way through it so to answer your the short answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> the way we got there was actually, uh, I was thinking about larger kind of thematic things. Like it sounds weird because whenever you do these crossover things, people, I know when we announced the original Rick and Morty versus uh, Dungeons and Dragons, people were like, oh, heartless, you know, corporate uh, uh, function. And it was like, no, we were doing this thing to have a lot of fun with it. And we were kind of amazed that both Adult Swim and um, Wizards of the Coast let us kind of take pot shots in all directions as, yeah. as a good Rick and Morty you know, story should. And um, I, one of the things that that when Pat Rothfuss and I co-wrote uh, the first miniseries together, we thought about big themes. We thought about big ideas that would make the story, you know, feel a little bit more rich and full than just, hey, look, these two things you don't expect to go together, go together. <laughs> and so um, what we did was, uh, you know, we, we were thinking about what is Dungeons and Dragons mean and and what does it mean to the individual characters and how do we exemplify or contrast their personalities through the use of the game and the way that we, I don't know how much D&D you've played. I'm sure this has come up in other conversations we've had, but you know, sometimes you, you are more of yourself at the gaming table and sometimes yeah. you're something very different where you're literally, I'm going to be someone unlike myself. I'm going to just tune it in a totally different direction mm -hmm. and see how that feels. Cause that's kind of fun escapism in its own way. Um, and so for Rick and Morty Cthulhu, I thought about, you know, this core idea of a lot of people will say that Rick Sanchez is a nihilist. You know, he doesn't care about anything and he, he only, you know, entropy and the destruction of the universe. And he's very, very, very cynical. Yeah. And he is cynical. But, you know, it's funny that people say to me he's a nihilist because it's like, no, it's so obvious he cares about other people and he cares about his family and he cares about he, he actually, you know, has that crusty exterior and he's cruel right. and he can be violent and awful and sarcastic and, and all those sorts of things. But it it so obviously hides a squishy, you know, center. That isn't to say that he's all love and things like that, but that he's protecting himself because he's been hurt and traumatized and all this kind of stuff. Absolutely. You know? Well, and, and then he's burdened by knowledge. Yeah, like, he, right. He knows... He's burdened by knowledge and he's burdened by this understanding that there are infinite universes and all this kind of stuff and yeah. the terrible things he has done and all this kind of things. He's a very, uh, you know, he, he's a character that is at odds with himself in all these different ways. And he's wielding his, in, you know, intelligence like a cudgel, right? Yeah. Um, and so he's not a true nihilist. And I said, but what if he came up against a true nihilist? What if he came up against, well, what is the ultimate nihilism? You know, the, the idea that none of nothing matters and everything is transitory and, and insignificant. Well, the Cthulhu mythos, Lovecraft's classic, you know, horror tales are about the fact that once you realize how insignificant you are, that these alien forces and elder gods could snuff us out in an instant, if they even realized we mattered. Right. Um, then you go mad you go mad because that's how insignificant things really are that that yeah. you know the full kind of lizard brain just sort of ejects out and and you lose it and so i thought well what if you put the ultimate narcissist against the ultimate nihilist <laughs> you know like let's that's kind of where the story came from and i had emailed um you know i think the expectation was oh well clearly we're going to do a trilogy of these rick and morty D D books and I, I just kind of didn't want to do the expected thing. I didn't just want to go, we're back for a third one because that's yeah. what we trilogies are, things people do. <clears throat> and so I said, you know, let's let's kind of zig and zag a little bit from where people think we're going to go. Um, <clears throat> and Sarah Gatos, who was uh, my editor at Oni at the time, I just sent her an email. I think the title of the email was like, how about this? And then mm -hmm. the, the body of the email was Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu. And she was like, call me. I was like, great. So we got on the phone and chatted for a little bit. And that's a really fun kind of place to be at. Like, 
I used to, and, and all the writing tutorial stuff that I have on my website has got this very formal structure. Here's how you put a pitch together. Here's how it works. And here's how you impress upon a publisher and editor that you are a professional. But I, you know, I could honestly add probably another article or a PS, but it's not really necessary that you need to tell people at some point in time, if you're established, you know, these rules may not apply to you anymore. Right. You know exactly. I mean? like, <clears throat> that's an awkward thing to say, but it's true. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like that, that at some point in time, you know, Tom Brevoor, my editor in the Avengers office at Marvel, we went from these highly formalized pitches where he's sending me comments and markups to a mm -hmm. uh, quick couple paragraphs or let's jump on a call. Yeah, that's good. Because if I tell you this part's going to be emotional or this is going to be really crazy or this action scene is going to be powerful, I've proven it enough that I don't have to formalize it. You, have to, you don't have to ask permission anymore. Right, and, right, and he can right. just say like, you know, like Hawk, I wouldn't do that or like, no. Right, exactly. And that's not to say that I wouldn't formalize it because I still do in many sure. cases. But the initial pitch is much more kind of shoot yes. from the hip or off the cuff or hey, let's talk through these problems, solve half of it, and then I'll go back and do the documentation if needed, you know? Yeah. And so that was sort of the situation here where literally I pitched it verbally. Sarah was like, this is great. Was already starting to talk to Adult Swim about, hey, we want to do this. And I said, I can't do it without Troy Little. He's the greatest, amazing cartoonist. <clears throat> I love working with him. We're such a great team. And then we got Troy committed. And while I'm writing the pitch, you know what I mean? Like, wow. so it's this weird kind of, it's Excuse just it different. all came together. Yeah. 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 That's just the way, you know, it, it, it works now. And so it was cool to be able to kind of have the, the green light essentially almost instantly for us to move forward on it and then just yeah. make it as awesome as we could. You know? Now, did you have yeah. it all fully formed in your head when you were like, okay, so Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu, or were you just kind of like, that'd be really dope. I have this concept. Like it's right. more like I have the high concept. We'll, right. we'll, we'll whittle down what the story is. Well, after we get the green light. No, I, 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 that, that nihilism versus narcissism was sort of at the core of it. And so yeah. the best kind of stories and conflicts you want to figure out um, what is the, what is the concept and then, you know, or what is the conflict and then how do you, what we call like test the concept or test the, the conflict, like how do I prove to you this is a worthy concept or a worthy okay. conflict? And then how do I, you know, up the stakes and all this kind of stuff. And then you've got, okay, what is the core thing? Well, so my idea is, and this isn't too much of a spoiler, it's even in some of the preview pages that went out very uh, recently. The idea that I had was, you know, Cthulhu has become this meme. It's become this thing that pop culture, you know, it latches on to whatever is popular and it just sucks the life out of it to make <laughs> money, right? So I said, yeah. you know, Lovecraft has become sort of its own entity that just, it's like bacon. You just slap it on the side of something and then you go, look, it's a new thing because we <laughs> added bacon to it or whatever. Oh, we added yeah. Cthulhu. Now it's it's a new it's board subversive game. now, yeah. Yeah, it's, oh, well, huh, I bet you weren't expecting that, you know? And so I said, great, like, Rick and Morty, the IP is now popular enough that Cthulhu is paying attention and right. realizes it can extend its own life force once again by <laughs> attaching itself like a parasite to the Rick and Morty intellectual property. Oh. And because there's always this meta concept, you know, like Rick looks at the audience and says shit or he knows structurally yeah. what storytelling kind of tropes they're playing on. I was like, let's just lean into that. So Rick is a aware Cthulhu exists and it attaches itself like a parasite to things. B, it's happened now. The the IP is popular enough that it's worthy. And Rick knows that that is the nadir, that once you've hit Cthulhu, you've run <laughs> out of creative juice and you're all downhill from there. So he, uh. the, it, at its core, essentially, Rick and Morty versus Cthulhu is Rick doing everything in his power to not have the crossover happen. Right. It's him trying to meta textually destroy Lovecraft before Lovecraft gets to them. <laughs> this is so. all this is almost a Gwenpool pitch. It is. It does have a bit of that kind of feel, right? Like it's definitely the meta is way, way over the top. And so yeah. Rick and the family end up going to a dimension, the Lovecraft dimension, where all that stuff is real. Okay. And they're going to destroy it all bit by bit. And instead of just uh -huh. going right for the throat with Cthulhu, he's like, we got to warm up. We got to like weaken his power base. So they're going to rip up every classic, you know, Cthulhu story in the mythos, right? Uh -huh. So the we got the color out of space and we got the, you know, In's mouth and, and Dagon and like all this stuff from all the other stories. Yeah. And then we do some pretty obscure ones and some ones that are on the fringes of kind of the, the Lovecraftian fandom. We spend an entire issue riffing on 
one of the weirdest and um, I wouldn't even say obscure. It's just like not the shadow out of time is this twisted weird ass story where a guy ends up, his mind gets transported into this alien body and he okay. realizes there's this gargantuan library archive where they're recording all of human history and knowledge because it's all going to go away kind of. Okay. Um, and it's twisted and bizarre and not really horror. It's more, it's, I mean, it's horror in this existential sense, but it's just like weird, messy sci-fi kind of concepts yeah. that could only exist at the turn of the century kind of stuff. Sure. And um, I, I just thought it was so out of what you typically think of as Lovecraft that I kind of wanted to lean into it. And I can't say how it all happens because I don't spoil some plot stuff, but sure. that issue might be my favorite. And it's the one that, that almost drove Troy mad because it's so ah. bizarre. <laughs> the alien creatures, they call them the, uh, the yith and they're these, they call them conical beings. They're like these, I think they're 18 feet tall, weird pyramids with these googly heads and all this tentacle stuff. And they don't speak because they're past language that way. They clack right. with their claws. They have these giant lobster claws. Okay. And so the poor letterer has to do all the word balloons to the claws. Oh my God. And <laughs> on every panel, Troy has to put claws in the panel to make them speak properly. That's awesome. It's so dumb. It's so dumb. <laughs> it's so good. And it's so fun. And Troy and I are just going for it, you know, yeah. and, and like weird references to other things. And it's just been so much fun to put together. And if you don't know the Cthulhu stories, that's cool. It's actually no problem. You can just read it and kind of get dragged along on the ride. And there's going to be appendices in every issue where I do a quick overview of what Lovecraft stories we went through and, oh and where the references are, you know. And so yeah. if you want to go back and read the stuff, uh, you can, you know. And the other great thing is because the very first thing Sarah asked me when I verbally pitched this, she she said, what about the racism? And I said, aha. <laughs> boy no problem not no problem racism but no problem yeah. we're gonna solve that because rick is aware uh he that's the other thing he doesn't want to be associated with lovecraft because it's racist paranoid garbage yeah. and so he's basically like we have to kill this thing because it's going to taint us because you know there's going to be all these terrible articles written about how we're associated <laughs> with racists you know and so that's the other thing he's every time they show up in one of these stories he like literally they show up in in's mouth and he goes yeah so this is uh lovecraft's uh thinly veiled you know symbolism for interbreeding and that's why he's a giant piece of shit let's go kill everything you know so <laughs> like like that's kind of the gag is yeah. is we just front load it like yeah this guy is terrible and yet right. this stuff has you know lodged into our popular our culture subconscious. And, yeah, yeah yeah and and you can make fun of this thing while still, I think, appreciating some of the larger symbolic and, and seismic kind of changes that it that it made within the genre. And I think yeah. that's where we have a lot of fun with it. And again, in a very meta way, we can get away with quite a bit. So um, yeah, there was a whole sequence and, and you're having conversations with my, you know, with Sarah, with the editor, and you're talking and you're sort of like, hey, I think, you know, here's where we can go with this stuff and we can really push out in these crazy corners in the way that only I feel like Rick and Morty can, like we can get right. away with such insane crap in here. And because it's cartoony, we can also get heinously violent in ways that I think if you drew it realistically, people would be like, Oh, like, I don't know. If you extreme, could yeah. yeah. Here we're just like going for it, which is great. You know? So yeah, uh, there's a lot of, of bonker stuff in there and we're having a good time with it. Yeah. Um, so that's been very cathartic um, and, and amusing. Uh, on the other end, it's back, not even on the other end, but in a similar kind of vein where you're trying to push the envelope, I feel like uh, Ray Fox and I are doing that with Murder World at Marvel. Yes. Um, Murder World, I had been teasing to you for ages. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been we, talking about Murder World without <laughs> saying the word Murder World forever. For, for a, a, over a year, easy. No worries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so Murder World uh, is, of course, like, you know, arcade, the classic. Although he's called an X-Men villain, that's not where he first appeared. Um, his first appearance was in Marvel Team Up. It's a, a Spider-Man story with Captain Britain. Um, but but his next appearance, I'm pretty sure, was X-Men, and he just became kind of an X-Men staple from there. You know what I, you know what I bet it was? Hmm. The video game. Yeah. Oh, no, this was before arcade. the video game. Oh, I know. No, I'm saying, like, because of the Spider-Man X-Men arcades revenge right, video game. Right, right, right. Like, yeah, culturally yeah. speaking, everyone's just like, oh, right, arcade. Yeah. 
Yeah. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, X-Men. Yeah. He's such a, you know, it's funny because he's, I know a lot of people in my generation, he's a beloved kind of villain because he's got this Joker-esque kind of, you know, over the top, colorful, cartoony sort of play. And he's putting characters in these terrible, dangerous circumstances, but it's all ridiculous, you know, and thematic and and riffing on a lot of pop culture stuff. And that was always a lot of fun. You'd be reading it and you're like, I remember there's an X-Men story where they're riffing on like um, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome and like stuff like that. And you're like, this is so awesome. Or or in um, Excalibur, they did a whole Alice in Wonderland thing and stuff like that. And just really, really fun, creative kind of ways to to put your characters into peril. Um, But what had happened was that this is easily my oldest pitch of all time. So before I have any kind of major writing credits whatsoever, I'm working at the Udon studio. And um, uh, at the time, Udon's doing work for Marvel. They were doing a book called Sentinel. They were doing Agent X. They had previously done Deadpool. I think they were coloring on like Uncanny X-Men, like a bunch of different stuff was happening. They were doing yeah. licensing art and all that kind of stuff. I was working on different kinds of projects, but love comics, would love to get in there. And I was talking to my boss and, and expressed multiple times, I would love to write, you know, comics. I would love to do this. And Eric is such a, Eric Co, he's such a great guy and so generous and all very like, oh yeah, you're one of the family. Like we got to make this happen. Let's, let's see what's possible. Do you have good ideas? And I would, you know, throw ideas around or whatever. He said, oh, we should show Joe Q. If you got an idea, you know, put it together. We'll send it to Joe Quesada, <laughs> editor-in-chief of Marvel. I'm like, oh, uh, okay, well, we're not messing around. Like this, I got to do something really special. Yeah. <clears throat> My buddy Ray, we had actually met when I was in university, and he was aspiring writer, and he was starting to make get headway. And so we had been chatting about a bunch of different story stuff. And I said, you know, we're not going to get – I'm not going to get like A-list – kind of characters or stuff. I, so we got to go at it with something really different. And at the time, you know, Joe and was doing some really different stuff. Yeah. You know, they had the Marvel Max line, but they were also just doing funky miniseries about things, you know? Yeah. And so I said, you know, what could we do? And we ended up talking about um, Murder World as this kind of battle royale sort of concept. And, and we said one of the problems with Arcade is that because he's trying to put these heroes in peril – you will never really kill Spider-Man. Right. You're never going to kill Captain Britain. You know what I mean? Like he's sort of the least successful (laughs) villain. Like, I mean, all villains aren't successful. Dr. Octopus never actually wins in the end or things like that. But, right. But murder world's never actually murdered anybody. We're like, (laughs) this is kind of, I mean, I'm sure there are select secondary characters or whatever, but on the whole, it's not very murderous in murder world. And that seems like a, you know, unfortunate and so we were yeah. like how do we put the murder back in murder world how do we really <laughs> you know cap this stuff and make it feel intense and so we were saying well we need to introduce a bunch of characters so we can murder a bunch of them you know yeah sort of do it in that horror movie kind of style where you set up characters and then knock them down like dominoes right and then that conversation sort of went around like all right so let's think of this more like murder world like like west world where you got the here the the villains are these robotic heroes running around murdering people mm-hmm. and that's how arcade makes his money when he's not trying to actually kill spider-man or trying to actually <laughs> kill the x-men he's been quietly killing you know any anything from just assassinating people for fun for money for for businesses or billionaires for years yeah. and that's where he kind of gets his his kicks mm. and um you know we generated this idea where we put together a group of contestants and each of them had their own secrets and each of them had their own reasons for basically entering a contest that Mer- that uh, Arcade has opened up to them. And whether or not they're going to survive, we're going to, you know, knock them down like dominoes and, and do really crazy things and have betrayals and triple crosses and all this kind of stuff. And it was yeah. this very dark and kind of nasty, cynical kind of story about, murder world you know and how arcade does what he does when you're not seeing the colorful version of him trying to kill the x-men yeah and we pitched it to joe and the email we got back was i think it was something basically like yeah this is kind of cool who the hell are these guys <laughs> like, <laughs> like these guys have no cachet like like you know yeah how do we it, sell it like yeah you know that if you're a tv writer then i could say oh coming from tv or if you're some you know playwright or whatever you guys right. are literally just like fanboys who just came up with this thing and you happen to get one past the goalpost to get this in front of me and that's cool <laughs> right go get but... some go get some experience or whatever you know like <laughs> go, go do the thing yeah. and uh so ray ends up 
going on to a, quite a successful writing career at DC. He ended up writing uh, Constantine and he did um, uh, Batman Eternal with uh, Scott Snyder and Tynan and those guys. Yep. He did a bunch of other stuff <clears throat> uh, over at DC. And then slowly but surely, you know, I put together my own kind of writing career, not in any sort of way like, and then we're going to pitch Murder World, but just no. like, <laughs> I want to be a writer, right? So making my own stuff slowly but surely kind of breaking through. And then um, I start getting my first work at Marvel in 2014 and my editor is Bill Roseman. We were working on that figment book and some other stuff. And he said, you know, I'd love to get you doing like proper Marvel universe superhero stuff. And I'm like, oh, that'd be great. We were chatting. And I said, you know, I've got this idea for this arcade story. <laughs> yeah. And he was actually the editor for that um, Avengers Arena, which was an right. arcade book. And he's like, oh, we just did that. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. Boo, it's never going to happen. <laughs> and um, at, at the start of this year, I was having a great conversation with C.B. Cebulski, and we were talking about Thunderbolts. So I'm currently doing the Thunderbolts, and I don't normally do pitches that are like, hey, it's like this meets that. Like, I, I that's a very Hollywoody kind of thing. You know, yeah. it's like Harry Potter meets The Walking Dead by way of Pokemon. And you're like, what yep. does that even mean? Like, why, why? You're just, <laughs> you're just slamming popular culture things together and hoping that someone says, I will pay you money. Yes. And so, you know, you need to kind of come at it from a, like a thematic or like a, here's, here is the elevator pitch, but it's not just popular thing meets trendy yeah. thing. Like you, you need something right. more going on. Um, but I, one of the ways I did explain Thunderbolts was like, I wanted to have this real Ted Lasso feel like the underdog kind of character trying to be the leader that he needs to be, even if he's not the most qualified for the job, trying to figure out, get back to when he was good and struggling with these internal emotional things, all with this comical front, all with these jokes and these, have you watched Ted Lasso? Of course. Yeah. No, I've seen it all the way up to so the, good. the yeah. so good. The characters moments are so rich and it's heartfelt. Yeah. Everyone's got their heart on their sleeve. And even when you're laughing, there's this wistful kind of quality to it. Yes. And I'm like, I want to capture that in Thunderbolts, not, you know, one-to-one, -one, but like the way I felt watching that show is how I want readers to feel when they finish, you know, an issue. Yeah. If I'm doing it right with a bit more Marvel flair and action and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And so CB and I were talking about that. He really liked the pitch and he liked the Ted Lasso angle and, and stuff like that. And he said, you know, if you got another one of those in your pocket, let me know because you got a pitch <laughs> at me. And I was laughing. He said, you know, if you got like a squid game or something. Oh my God. <laughs> and I laughed and I went, CB, this is crazy. I've actually got a squid game. And he's like, Come on. I was like, no, no, I'm serious. I really do. Yeah. I said, Marvel has a squid game all ready to go. And he goes, okay, I'm listening. I said, it's murder world. And he goes, sure. Like, yes, I don't disagree with you. But right. saying murder world is squid game is one thing. What's the core of the story? What's the hook? Why do we care? And exactly. I said, I literally have the pitch. I've had it for a long time. Give me a day. Just cause I want to look over the document, make sure it's not garbage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll, I'll send it to you. And he was like, oh, okay. And so I look over this. Thank God my archives are deep and I've got all my files organized. And I dig through my, got a Marvel idea folder and I pull out that old <laughs> document that Rand and I put together and I give it a once over and I add maybe like three sentences and tweak some of the wording, but it's all there. The story's really sharp and the turns and the twists are really good. And, and it's something that we haven't quite seen before. Yeah. And I send it over. And I'm just like, whatever, like whatever happens, you know, it'd be great. And then to get immediate response, they're very positive about it, sends it over to Jordan in the X-Men office. And Jordan thinks it's great. And Jordan's a really big horror movie fan. So he's just like, yeah, let's go for a really dark, really nasty. I love it. Uh, and he goes, but my plate is full, you know, with the whole Krakoa line. So sure. he ends up talking to some of the other editors, Sarah Brunstad picks it up and says, this is awesome. I'm going to champion it. I'll carry it through. And right up until I'm like, I haven't even told Ray that I just repitched this thing. <laughs> this <laughs> now 18 year old pitch, this yeah. pitch is old enough to vote. Right. Uh, and, and we're, and we're off the traction. races. Like it's yeah, happening. Getting, yeah. Like, yeah. There's no art. Yeah. Up thought, until, yeah. yeah. Up until we actually, the solicit came out. I just assumed it wasn't going to happen because I was yeah. like, no, they're going to find a reason not to do it. Or they're going to say, you know what? Maybe this violent a book is not, you know, the Marvel brand. Maybe we yeah. don't want this in there. When you've but, been there uh, before with, uh, oh, yeah. what was it? That Suicide Squad story that had yes. been forever. Yep. And then I've had stuff thrown in drawers. I've had, you know, 
not tons. I'll be honest. You know, when I talk to people who work in movies or TV and the, for them, it feels like they got to do 10 to get one made, you know what yeah. I mean? And I feel so fortunate that in comics, that has just not been the case. Like I, I, 90% of what I've written has been released in some fashion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, which is pretty amazing and feels really good. Um, yeah. And this is one of those ones that got away, but I didn't do that thing that I think so many writers do. And I totally understand the impetus where a project you really want to have happen happens uh, or doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden you're bitter and frustrated and you're talking in an interview and someone goes, well, what would you do with so-and-so? And then you just blab it all out. Yeah. Because you're like, no one's ever. Gonna well, I'm never going to anyway. get a chance to do this, so I might as well. You hear this all the right. time where they're like, "Oh, your run got cut short on X. What would you have done?" And yeah. you know, even Claremont telling you every plot line he would have done in the X Men, or you know, all that kind of stuff. And I totally get it. I understand that frustration and the need to just like, well, screw it. Here's all yeah. my idea, blah, because <laughs> you you want that visceral you know reaction but best case scenario a bunch of readers go yeah that's awesome and then they comment on reddit or say that would have been cool and then it just goes that's it buried into the archives of time or whatever you know right because what's not going to happen is an editor reads that interview and goes like right. oh that is a really good idea yeah I guess well we now that everyone that. knows the big turn why don't we just uh you know not do, do that because yeah. that's that yeah. <laughs> and you never know like where you're going to be able to repurpose some of those aspects or yeah. or whether it's that story will come to pass as you want it or you realize it can fit somewhere else or you realize you can take a core precept of it and reinvent it for another character or another scenario another story you know yeah. some of the stuff that i did in agents of wakanda was actually they were uh one of them was a mission idea that i originally had for the thunderbolts when i wrote it back in 2015 so it was like um with winter soldier and his crew my idea was that they were continuing that thing of you know nick fury being the man on the wall trying to right. keep earth safe and i just generated because that was like my first marvel uh monthly book i threw like God, 10 or 12 crazy mission ideas in there like they could do this we could do a one-off issue about this or a two-parter about that and i didn't realize i had the job i thought i had to like <laughs> generate really so them and generate yeah. all that yeah. tom would be like yes, you're the man. Like instead Tom was like, wow, there's probably too much here. You know, I was like, Oh, okay. Sorry. You know, I didn't know. <laughs> and so I ended up repurposing some of those mission things using them for agents of Wakanda. And I've got a few, I would still love to use later on, but I'm not going to tell everybody, you know, yeah, Keep your powder dry. And so now all of a sudden the murder world thing is happening. We're doing it. Uh, I got to call Ray up and say, Hey, guess what? <laughs> We're going to do this book together. And he was so awesome about it. Ray's an amazing guy anyways, but he was just like, you could have done this on your own. Like it has been 18 years. I barely remembered us putting that pitch together. You could have just ran with it. And I said, no, we pitched it together. That was the deal. And we're doing mm -hmm. it together. And we've never co-written before. And that was a really fun challenge in a, in a good way. We both got, we this story, we've got really similar tastes on how we approach things. But I just wasn't sure. Sometimes yeah. you've got, you know, different approaches to how you script or how you dialogue or how you do any of that stuff. And yeah. we've been surprisingly kind of in sync on it. It's been It's been great. Well, and you're no stranger to collaborating with different right. uh, talent and telling one cohesive story. Yeah. And it's suspicious to see the Zub name associated with all these really <laughs> well-executed synergistic stories like the No Surrenders and the, right. you know, Thanks, and, and, and the Murder Worlds where it's like, oh, like you see some big names on there. You got Zub, yeah. you got Ewing, you got Wade, you got Fox. And it's like, it doesn't feel like one person kind of went like, all right, you tell me the ideas and then I'll right, right. work my magic, you know? Right. All, yeah, totally. You know, no, it, uh, I think it's really important that you, in any of these kind of collaborations, that you're able to recognize people's strengths and that you're yeah. also, you've got to be, when I say compromise, I don't mean like compromise the vision. I mean, like, be willing to admit you don't have all the answers, you know right. what I mean? And that right. uh, defend your ideas. And if they can survive, you know, those things, then they're meant to be but let's try and amp it up as much as possible. And I think right. because I came from an animation background, I'm already used to that kind of collaboration. I'm used to the fact that it's not going to be generally an auteur kind of thing. You don't come yeah. in and go, oh, I know exactly how this is meant to be. Like even in, in, in animation, although there is a director, 
the storyboard artist, for example, has a huge swing in how an animated film looks and feels. They, you'll, a storyboard artist will do a pitch session where they boarded out a whole sequence of a film. And even though they've got the script and the director said, here's what that scene is all about, the board artist, by their shot choices and by the amount of time they're spending on particular sequences, and sometimes just adding whole cloth material can completely change the way a sequence feels. Yeah. And they're not the director even, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so I feel like it's very similar to the collaborative process with comic book artists or with an editor where you're basically like, hey, this is what I think it matters and I will sell it to you as strong as I can. But you've got to bring some of yourself into this. Otherwise, you're not going to care. It's not going right. to matter, you know? Yeah. And and the same thing with a co-writer, you know, when Ray and I sit down and we chatter, it's like, this is the moment I'm leading up to. And I think is going to pay off really big. How can we just squeeze as much out of the, you know, as much juice as we can out of it? How can we really shock people and amaze them or surprise them? Uh, one of the things I loved is we sent in our first script and Sarah had to check like four different things, whether or not we could get it past the rating, you know, for the book. Mm. And I, and I thought, Oh geez, this is going to be hellish. And she was like, do it every issue, push further than you think you can go because I don't want you to hold back. Like I want right. this book to be as far as we can take it. And even if we don't have see all of it on panel, we can infer a lot. And yeah. in some cases it can be gorier in your mind than it ever would be on the page anyways. Absolutely. Um, but she's like, don't, don't pre-edit it in your mind and assume that you know where we're going to go, you know, yeah. like just take it. And we've been, it's been great. It's been great. Honestly, there's some stuff in there that I'm amazed we've been able to get it past the filter. You know, <laughs> Even early on, we had a discussion about murder world as a title. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was sort of like, you know, does the Walt Disney corporation want a book with a the word book? murder in it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort in of lights. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big, big, you know, glittering. Right. And, and, you know, we explained why we thought that's to be the anything else is going to feel weird and not quite on, you know, it's not right. going to quite sell what we needed to do and all that kind of stuff. And so it's been great. It's been really good and collaborative. We've got a really cool um, set of artists working on the books and all of them are delivering awesome stuff to it. It's yeah. being laid out in a series of five one shots, which is this kind of format that I think has been working well for Marvel over the past few years. Yeah. Um, they did it with like demon days and, and stuff like that. Uh, they've got some other, I forget what it's called. They've got some other, uh, um, event stuff they've been doing in that format. I mean, yes. I guess it's not that new. I'm trying to think, cause they even did it right. with some of the, the cosmic stuff. I think years ago oh, yeah. they did. The oh yeah. Format as well. well, I remember uh, we were talking about, um, how just, uh, AXE just wrapped up. And right. uh, my wife is like the expert on axe. So I just let her kind of talk right. about it when we refer, when we review it. The expert. The expert, yeah, ah. yeah. Oh, and she was like, and I was like, uh, is there an Omega issue? And she, was like, of course, there's an Omega issue. Right, like the, every event now has like an al, like an at least if there isn't an Alpha issue, there is right. always an Omega issue. It reminded me of, um, oh God, what was it? Uh, the old annual events where it's like yes. there are there are two issues of the event. Right. And there are 25 tie-ins. That's right. That's right. Those annuals were kind of neat though. I kind of yeah. like I think I was the perfect age for like evolutionary war and Atlantis <laughs> attacks. Yes. Where it's like they were coming out and it was a really big deal. And you yeah. were like, whoa, okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Atlantis attacks. Yeah, let's go. And you'd pick them up. And some of them were good and some of them were like tenuous tie-ins at best. Yes. But it felt like because those those books were thick enough that they had a spine on them too. Yeah. You were like, yeah, I'm getting some value. Yeah. Getting and you kind of stuff. are. But also, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, it's yeah. not like the, the Atlantis barely attacks. Atlantis yes. Atlantis yeah. Attacks. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. There's and, a lot uh, of meandering and stuff. But I yeah. think because they also had this cool thing where <clears throat> in the backs of those issues, both of those events, they had these backup stories that were giving you greater context for continuity. Yes. Which, of course, is my big jam, you know, <clears throat> the interconnectedness of the Marvel Universe and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So they're giving you the history of the Serpent Crown or they're giving you the the history of the High Evolutionary. And these are yeah. issues that in the back issue bin I couldn't afford. So it was like this cool glimpse at all oh, these old stuff I really yeah. love, you know, and bringing it back out into the light uh, I thought was really cool. I'm, I'm not surprised in the least that you referenced Atlantis attacks given the crown of set and uh, yes, right. <laughs> and it's got Hyborian age stuff all over it. I mean, we did uh, when I pitched that Conan crossover book, Serpent War, Serpent the original War, yeah. pitch for it wasn't called Serpent War. 
I think literally the title came back to like put the word war in it because because war sells because war still sells <laughs> war still sells 35 baby. years the word secret the word war you know how that that's how um she that's how they got out. it yeah, yeah he literally they, it was a marketing thing where they were like the These word the secret words. is really popular <laughs> yeah war. it's like secret war all right it's the best all of right both done worlds. yeah the only thing could have possibly been more potent the year the secret war came out was if you would put the word ninja in it you know that's about <laughs> it so <laughs> i'm surprised there's never been a marvel secret ninja war oh well, hold on a second. See, like, there you have it. Let's, that, that, ladies and uh, gentlemen, that's why <laughs> the, the genesis so. right here, right? Right. But yeah, the um, <clears throat> yeah, I love that stuff. Love that. Love the the fact that the Hyborian Age is is the ancient past of the Marvel universe or whatever. <laughs> I guess true. not anymore, but technically, I think theoretically, it kinda, yeah, theoretically it is. But yes. yeah, apropos of that, um, mm. you know, with Conan. <laughs> You know, we talked about like not throwing away your darlings. Um, right. You know, you, one might have been encouraged uh, if they were wrapping up their Conan run, let's say from Marvel <laughs> Comics. Right. Say, well, it's, it's a shame that are ending. It's a shame he's going to another company, you know, but because uh, here's what I would have done with the character. I yeah, had a lot totally. more stories to tell. Or, or I think carrying a chip on your shoulder. I, I yeah. you know, um, when I was wrapping up on, I think it might have even been my first run on Thunderbolts. <clears throat> I'd been talking to Gail uh because we we had done the conan red sonia crossover and i was just talking about you know advice in general and she said one of the things she tries not to do is read a book after with the same characters after she leaves it like she mm. needs some distance because yeah. no matter how good it is either the two extremes either it's it's you know suddenly explodes in sales and awards and and, and gets all like these adulations and you're like oh that's <laughs> what it be, you know yeah or it sucks and you're like i would have done it different and you'll probably say i would have done it different no matter what right no matter what yeah and and, and you know because you can't you have to be you have to love the stuff you're working on but you need to be able to let it go because you don't own it you don't get to keep it yeah. and so for me i've always looked at working on conan as a gift and I know that sounds very corny, but it's true because each time has always felt like, well, this will never happen again. Oh, like, sure. The Conan Red Sonia crossover with Gail was, oh, my God, I get to write this character is so important to me and get to work with her and get to do the crossover. First time these characters have met, I think, in 15 or 16 years. Yeah. And we're going to tell this epic tale. and This is going to be so cool. And one of the things when I was brainstorming with Gail early on, I said, well, what era are we dealing with? Like that when they're young and impetuous or them in their prime or, you know, the King Sonia and Queen, sorry. Queen Sonia and King Conan <laughs> in their, you know, respective kingdoms. And uh, she quite wisely said, let's do them all. Let's have oh, a threat oh. that emerges when they're young, come back to haunt them when they're older. And I was like, yeah. oh, my God, we don't have to choose. We can do it all. <laughs> and so um, it was such a great experience. I thought, well, that's if that's my only chance to write Conan, then what a cool one to do. Definitely. And then, you know, Marvel got the rights to Conan and Tom came to us we had done avengers no surrender <clears throat> we were in chicago and it was uh mark wade was there we all went for dinner and we were just chatting and tom's like all right here's why i really called you together for dinner and i was like oh <laughs> there's a reason i thought we were just having pizza and beer or whatever <clears throat> and he said um this isn't known yet but marvel's getting the rights to conan back we want to really make a big splash we're going to have him appear first in this next avengers event i want you guys yes. to do and my first reaction was no that's a terrible idea. The fans will hate it. You know, you're going to sully the Hyborian age or whatever. And, and then I suddenly realized, Hey, that was stupid. Cause Hey, I really want to write this thing. Um, and also if, if I don't write it, someone will ruin it. I got to do it right. Yeah. And so uh, that's kind of how I went into it. And I thought, Oh man, I get to write Conan again. And at the end of that event, I left Conan in the savage land. Cause I thought that'd be really fun. Yeah. And I didn't realize how potent that was because uh, Jerry had already, Jerry Duggan had already been talking about, can I do a story of, you know, Conan running around, um, you know, the Marvel universe. And then Tom's like, we'll tee you up. And I was like, cool, great. Go for it. You know, go crush the thing. And um, it was, it was a really cool thing. And I thought that's my only chance to write Conan. And the only thing that I had that I was kind of carrying was this weird feeling of, man, both my Conan stories have got multiple writer credits. Mm -hmm. So you don't know which parts are me and which parts are the other people. Yeah. And then the writer ego kind of comes into it and you're like, I really just want, I just want one Conan story with my name on it. So then, you know, like, like it or hate it, that's mine. 
You know yeah. what I mean? And um, <clears throat> and that was where the the Savage Sword story came from. I was at New York and I was talking to Mark Basso, and I knew that the Savage Sword series was rotating creative teams. And I said, "Can I pitch a, a solo story? Like I really want to do." And he's like, "Sure, sure. You know, send me a proposal." And so I sent this idea for Conan's in this gambling hall where he can literally bet his life away and all this kind of stuff, um, yeah. and threats that he can't just drive a sword through. And uh, Conan Properties really liked it, and Mark really liked it, and we did it. Uh, Pat Zerker drew it, and it was this three-parter called The Gambler. And I thought, this is my last chance to write Conan. <laughs> got to do it to the best of my ability. Got to really deliver the goods and and do my mic drop. This is what I think a real Conan story should be all about, and then I can walk away you know, satisfied. Yeah. And um, instead, it went over so well with Conan Properties. They're like, you know, we really want to kind of shine up the other Robert E. Howard Properties would you have any interest in, in doing a crossover with these other characters, Solomon Kane and Dark Agnes in particular? And then I brought in this relatively obscure Robert E. Howard character named James Allison, who is might be, I don't want to put too fine a point on, he might be the first meta authorial character in fiction because yeah. he's basically Robert E. Howard. Uh, I see. Having these like nightmare lucid dreams of reincarnation and going through the ages. Um, and, and he's a very depressed and, and messed up dude. Um, and so I, I said, we'll use him as like kind of the fulcrum for all this time travel and cross dimensional stuff and, and everything else. And I handed in the, the, the idea and the original pitch was called kingdom of the worm, which is a cool sounding, uh, it's a great fantasy. Conan title. Yes. But like so your average person walking by on the stands and they're like kingdom of the worm. Like, <laughs> Yeah. It, can you change that to dragon? And it's like, yeah, yeah. No. Can we put the word war in it? You're like, right. yeah. And they're fighting, you know, sets one of the things they're fighting. So like serpent war. I was like, yeah, okay. That, that's a better title for your, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Kingdom of the worm is like the, by the New York times bestselling author. And it's just that, you know, and they've got a, it's a novel cover. It's not a comic book. Trade exactly. Cover. No yeah. human beings appear on the cover. It's that's just right. Serpent right. On like a, on a throne. Yeah, exactly. Like, right. Yeah. It's and so he painted, uh, but sadly, sure, no. Course, right. <laughs> And so we did the book. It was a ton of fun. I got done the first script on that. And then they told me Jason was leaving the flagship book. Would I be interested in taking over? And I was like, oh, my God. And I didn't say yes immediately um, because I was co-writing Iron Man with Dan Slott at the time. And we were we had a lot of material ahead of us. And I was like, oh, I don't want to screw this up. And it's like yeah. one thing to say, you know, you want to do a bucket list project. It's another thing to actually be handed it. Yeah. And to realize, do I actually have the juice? Can I make this thing work? You know? Yeah. And, and so I, I said, I'll get right back to you. And I thought about it for 24 hours and thought, made sure, yeah, I've got a bunch of stories. I have a plan. I know what I would do, et cetera, sure. et cetera. Also called up Tom and said, Hey, I'm really sorry. I got to step away from Iron Man. And he was sort of like, you have to, I already know you're being offered Conan. Like, if you don't take this, <laughs> you're going to regret it. I'm like, yeah. that's why you're awesome. Um, and then I grabbed the book with both hands and then one issue came out and then the pandemic happened and it yeah. was like, Oh my God. And so I had an absolute blast working on Conan and the artists I got to work with Raj in particular and Corey, they both did amazing work uh, on the book, but we were just like kind of hamstrung right from the get go, like yeah. the sales and the visibility and people kind of had more important things they were dealing with at the time. Um, yeah understandably and so we ended up i did 13 issues of conan but it was like this weird kind of under the radar for most of it and then the marvel wrapped up their license on the whole thing yeah and it was like well that's you know that's, that's that. the way it goes and i i wasn't i'm not well i'm not now obviously i wasn't <laughs> bitter i was like hey this whole thing was a gift i had the chance to work on this character i love and you know tell stories that i thought were cool and the readers responded to it well and that's the important thing you know yep. whatever happens happens um but it wasn't over the conan properties people really loved what i was doing it felt like i had a really strong hand on the rudder and know the character in the world really well and so we just kept talking and even as they were working things out and trying to decide what they wanted to do next we were still having these active conversations about, about Robert E. Howard material as a whole and their sort of future plans. I didn't even know at the time, Funcom, the video game company, they're the guys that do Conan Exiles and Age of Conan. Yes. They 
were buying Conan properties. So they now, the video game company has all the Robert E. Howard stuff in house so that they can use it at will. And they wanted to aggressively get it out as wide as possible. Mm. And what's most important for them is they want it to be great. Of course, they want high quality and they want it to be consistent and, and the right people, you know, the right fit. And so um, all of a sudden they were no longer just like, hey, let's find a publisher and license this thing. They're like, we want to be in creative control and then a publisher can publish it. And right. so um, I, I, it doesn't come this way. It doesn't come across this way in the news, but Titan is co-publishing Conan with what's called Heroic Signatures, which is the company that runs the license of Conan and, oh. and all the Robert E. Howard stuff. So I, my editor, for example, is at Heroic Signatures, this great guy, Matt Murray. We talk, we literally have a weekly call scheduled every Friday morning. And we talk about Conan, we talk about the long-term planning, we talk about media stuff and video games and everything. We just talk mm. Hyborian everything. And <laughs> It's been amazing. It's been amazing to work with them. And they asked me if I would be, you know, interested in telling more Conan, Conan stories. And they said, I said, yeah. And then it was, how many do you want to do? And I told uh, Fred, he's the guy in charge. I said, Fred, when they collect my Conan stuff, I want it to be in a book that's so big that if we drop it off a third story landing, it would kill a child. <laughs> like I want to write a lot of Conan. Like yeah. I, you will probably have to tell me to stop before I'm ready. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like that's yeah. the kind of thing I would love to do because it's really in my wheelhouse. And I feel like the character is just one of those iconic characters that people know and the permutations and your ability to take those ingredients. It's like a Batman or a Spider-Man or a, any of these characters. They're eternal. You can yeah. do cool stuff with them. And they're like, great. That's what we want to hear. We want you to be at the tip of the spear and, and relaunch the book with us, which seemed impossible it seemed crazy to me like i get sure. to write conan i get to have a long-term commitment on the character uh i told them who my dream artist would be to work on the book uh it's this um amazing artist named rob de la torre he has been doing these and they are very john buscema frank frazetta-esque kind of uh uh savage and amazing and intense classic looking you know illustrations and he's done a, a a couple conan comic stories but he's never really kind of been able to do a big run and so i said that's the guy like that's the guy i would love to team up with they reached out to him and we got it all cinched up now so next summer we're launching the hell out of conan the barbarian <laughs> and that's uh, awesome yeah and we've got a big whoop we got a big lead time on it so okay. um we're doing like I've got, you know, scripts already underway and we've got art already happening and covers being produced. The book doesn't launch until July and we have already got a good chunk, you know, underway, which is awesome, All right. which in comics terms is insane. Like no one ever works that far ahead unless you're doing some sort of a weekly or some sort of a thing. Yeah, we're not. But, but like in regular publishing, that's like still considered a quick schedule. Do you know what mm, I mean? Which is always yeah. funny. I do those. uh Dungeons and Dragons Young Adventures guides at Random House. Yeah. And whenever we tell them about our comic book schedule, they always think we're insane. Right. Because in, in traditional book publishing, right now we're working on material for this time next year. So I've got a book draft we just handed in a couple of weeks ago that'll be out just before Christmas 2023. And they're like, things are a little tight. And I'm like, <laughs> are, are, are they? A year out, we're a little bit tight. And in comics, right? it's sort of like, Hey, I'm sending you the lettering script. We're going to letter it tomorrow. It's going to be on the printing wheels Friday kind of thing. Oh my God. Just like, oh, geez, you know, or uh, you'll get a phone call and they're like, Did, can we make this edit? And I'm like, I thought this thing was printing. They're like, it is in two hours. We just need to tweak the digital file. <laughs> oh no. I'm just like, holy crap. Like that's comics. Comics is yeah. always this. We're throwing train tracks in front of the train as it runs yes. at high speed kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so everything else seems very sane compared to that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, it's funny because like the movies have kind of reflected that a little bit where you'll get like a movie and yeah. then the next weekend or maybe even within that weekend, the effects will suddenly change right. for that movie. And you're like, isn't that weird? Yeah. Is that movie now, out? And they're yeah, like, no, yeah. no, no, we removed all the buttholes. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. No Starbucks cups here. And it's like, that's everything can be patched now. You know, yeah. remember when you get a video game and it was a cartridge and you plugged it in and if there was a glitch, it was a glitch for all time. That's the glitch. Now you just, now you just patch the game. You can release games that are like unfinished trash 
and they're like, well, as long as they fix it in the first two weeks, the fans will forgive you. You're just that's like, literally wow. It. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy how that stuff goes. Um, yeah. You know, it's nice. It's nice to have the lead time. It's nice to be building this stuff out in a really big way. It's oh, nice yeah. to be like talking to everything from concept artists and designers on the video game side of things. And we're trying to like get this visually cohesive Hyborian age. Yeah. It feels now- like we're in one place doing all this stuff, you know? Yeah. Are you working on the video games too? Uh, no, nothing to announce that? at this no, moment, yeah. but there's there, all sorts of, it's yeah. all part and parcel of, of working in the broader structure, which is great, yeah. you know? And that's the fun thing as well. It's just being able to go, Hey, this is all connected and let's all have a cohesive vision and let's talk yeah. about the future. And let's, here's my priority as a storyteller for the comics. Does that jive with what you guys are thinking? If not, why not? And, right. and what are we all trying to do and deliver this cool kind of unified classic experience you know absolutely yeah which is awesome they've got concept artists that are just doing stuff so i'll say hey i'm going to be dealing with this part of the world do you guys have concept work we can show to rob or the cover artist or whatever oh wow yeah which is cool so then it's like and if they aren't they haven't worked in that area now they can start to prioritize it where they're like oh yeah we'll do more concept art in that part of the world and and you know what are your priorities while i'm working with these creatures and this stuff and these kinds of locations and that stuff just starts to happen which is really really cool um my editor has this is going to sound so corny but it's true he literally has like a robert e howard scholar on retainer that's a see no that i don't think that's corny at all i think that actually demonstrates a fundamental understanding right and 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 like kind of like prioritization like it they understand what they're doing right and they're doing it right they want they don't want to have to like they don't want to have to like patch it later they don't want right, to have to do right, right. Or clean it up like when i get think it right that's the first time. so cool about it you know because the as much as people may think of conan the barbarian as whatever an arnold schwarzenegger movie and and big burly guy throwing a half naked chick over his shoulder it is literary you know important like it is, he's the first sword and sorcery character. It's been around for almost a hundred years. And, you know, like it's, it's potent stuff and people have dedicated their entire, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, PhDs to like analyzing yes. his work and, and the worlds that he built. And so there is a ton of literary analysis of the worlds of Conan and the Hyborian age and Cull and Solomon Cain and all this kind of stuff. And so it's foolish not to utilize some of it or to understand it or to talk to those people because exactly. they have done the deep dive sometimes to the word to yeah. understand this stuff in fundamental ways that a little kid who was reading Roy Thomas comics didn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or some of the larger, you know, Robert E. Howard wasn't working in a vacuum. He was taking historical events or peoples and refashioning them for his own fantasy world and knowing what some of those influences are and knowing where some of those things came from gives you a greater context for how you are talking about them or what they mean or, you know, and, and it like anthropologically, right. You know, like, 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 um, all that kind of stuff, like your ability to discuss these things is going to make for a better book. You know, one of the things I would love to do is have back matter where we've got an essay from one of these guys talking about the literary source material or talking about, you know, the historical context of some of the things that we're playing with in this field. And it's still like a wicked pulpy action packed story and you can just read it and, you know, sword slay. And I will describe blood and bone and sinew in a dozen different ways that are going to get your heart pumping but also is in this cool it's part of this broader kind of tapestry you know yeah and it's funny because i remember uh hearing the announcement before the conan stuff that you were going to be working on red sonia right and i was like oh great like you get to you know conan's over but hey yep. you get to get that kind of like right you get, itch, you get to scratch that itch in your life totally totally with sonia, yeah and then the Conan stuff happened. And uh, both of those were two separate conversations. Completely which is different hilarious. conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Different two different groups. companies. Like Dynamite has the rights to Red Sonia, you know, the character. And that is, I think, one of the most confusing things for people who know. Yeah. Of Can the you character. help us a little bit just being like, is Red Sonia technically a Conan character? Right. Or is she a. Do you Conan know the answer to this or do you want I me to? Give I don't. I, okay. I, I, I figured you'd be able to elucidate that for I us. I do. I know exactly how all this stuff comes together. It's really weird, but it's kind of awesome. Okay. So yeah. 
here's where uh you know on your on your timestamp you can go history of red sonia yeah. right on the, <laughs> on the on the deadly do so red sonia is red sonia as you know her in the comics is not a robert e howard creation okay and yet <laughs> um there is a character named red sonia that robert e howard made and there is a sword swinging badass character that that robert e howard made Roy Thomas, when he was writing the Conan comic series, awesome stuff, he was going through and he was adapting a bunch of the classic Conan stories, but he did hundreds of other stories that were not, you know, based on an immediate, uh, um, you know, uh, story. Sometimes he would even adapt other fantasy stories or other stories from Robert E. Howard. He would file the serial numbers off, change the time period, <laughs> change the names and change the location. And all of a sudden a different Robert E. Howard story gets smack dab, you know, into thrown Conan. into the Hyborian age. And if you know the stuff, you'd be like, Oh, I see what you did there. You, you know, whatever. And one of the things he wanted was he wanted a regular uh, female foil for Conan that was not Belit. So Belit is uh, the character from the Queen of the Black Coast. She is the love of Conan's life. And spoilers, she tragically perishes. He wanted to keep his powder dry and bring that character in later. He doesn't want her to show up too early because once she's a part of the story, she's going to be there for a while. Right. So he needs something else. So there's this character called Dark Agnes, who is this woman, totally different time period, but she is this uh, woman who basically doesn't want to do woman's work. And she ends up slaying a paramour with a sword and going off and basically saying, if you cannot defeat me in combat, you cannot be my lover kind of stuff. Yeah. And there's another character that Robert E. Howard wrote called Red Sonia, but Sonia is spelled with a Y instead of a J. Okay. And she's Red Sonia of Rogatino. And she's a character from a different time period. She's like a pistolier and she's this rebel fighter and all oh, this kind of cool. stuff. And, uh, but she doesn't even have a huge role in this story. She's like one of a, a series of characters that shows up in this pulpy story that he wrote. And so Roy Thomas likes the name Red Sonia and the red hair idea. And right. he likes Dark Agnes. And he just <laughs> smashes them together and makes a new character called Red Sonia, spelled with a J. With a J. And she shows up in Conan the Barbarian number 24. Okay. And makes a big splash. You yeah. Know, Barry Windsor uh, Smith is in the height of his powers on that book, and he's crushing it. And she goes over great, and the readers love it. And he's like, oh, we got to keep her around. And then she becomes a regular kind of appearing character off and on in Conan to the point where once Savage Sword of Conan, the magazine starts, she becomes a regular feature in there. And then they give her her own solo book. Ah. And at that point, you're like, it's kind of sort of not really owned by Marvel because it's under the Robert E. Howard license that they had yeah. at the time. But what they needed to do was, from what I know, this um, they made that Red Sonja movie. Yes. In order to make the Red Sonja movie, they had to package all the rights together separate and self-contained so that it could be licensed. Okay. And they didn't want to license Conan and Solomon Kane and Dark Agnes and all these other characters. So they kind of excised her rights, made it its own company so that it could be turned into a movie. So you can package it, sell it, license it, make toys, coloring books and all that garbage. Yeah. And uh, the movie did not do well. Yeah, I was going to say, which of course was a huge success. We all, yeah, yeah. Huge, <laughs> we have, we have, we have mo monthly screenings of Red Sonja <laughs> uh, to this day. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but totally worth at it. that point now, the character separated into its own rights holding. And right. so it could be sold separately, which it eventually was. So Dynamite ends up getting the rights eventually for the comic rights to Sonya and starts making their own Red Sonja comics separate and distinct from the Marvel stuff that had been done before and distinct and separate from the, the Conan license. The interesting thing though, about the red Sonya packaging is that she is allowed to be in the Hyborian age and use any villain or any uh, location that is in the Hyborian age. No. Oh. So it's neat. They have a shared world. It's like a shared universe, but never shall Twain meet, you know, without yeah. separate lawyer agreements or whatever. Right. It's like Not this very weird thing. Not too similar from the, uh, the He-Man uh, She-Ra situation right. now. Where right. it's like, they're in the same universe, but she lives yeah. on Etheria and she, you know, the, she, so, she gets to say Grey Skull and stuff. But It's even funnier that He-Man was supposed to be a Conan cartoon. I don't know if you knew yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, 
look at it. <laughs> right, right. It's clear it was meant to be a Conan cartoon, which is also why um, you've you've got the villain of Skeletor is right. the skull faced necromancer, right? From sure. uh, from Cull, whose name I forget, who's the villain in the Conan movie. Oh. Wow, I just totally brain. Tulsa Doom. Tulsa Doom. Tulsa Doom is a Cull uh, villain. He's not a Conan villain. Oh, that yeah. explains why we don't see Thulsa Doom. Because like every time there's snakes and Conan, yeah, yeah. we're all like, well, when's Thulsa Doom going to show up? Right, right. <laughs> and Thulsa Doom is not, yeah, he's not actually a uh, a Conan villain. He's from the King Cole's time, which is a totally different time period. It's the pre yes, uh, Hyborian Hyborian. age kind of stuff. Yeah, if you think of the Hyborian age is almost, it sounds weird because it's, it is a like post-apocalyptic setting of Cole. It's like after the height and the the greatness of the empires of it's like the dark ages right yeah. it's like everything falls into disarray and you know uh, uh hundreds of thousands of years later that's the hyborian age everyone's picking up the pieces that's why there's ruins everywhere and destruction yeah. everywhere one of the cool things that we've been talking about is that kind of stuff back to the concept art where you're you're you know they're illustrating buildings how would they look in the atlantean age or back in the the pre-thurian age or whatever and then we could what would it look like if you had then that same location and we show it all windswept desert destroyed, you know, yeah. now we're finding the remnants of it, you know, all, all this time later, that's the the fun stuff we can do yeah. visually, you know, anyways, I'm crazy about this stuff. Red Sonia, it was something that I wanted to do more of. I had written her obviously on the crossover. I wrote a one shot special called um, Red Sonia and Cub. That was like her in the Eastern regions of the Hyborian age called Kitai. And that was a lot of fun. And I'd been sort of talking to dynamite. Like I would love to do a, just a classic kind of red Sonya story. And they were great. Yeah. You know, we'll be in touch. And then they would like, we would talk about things or every so often they'd say, Oh, do you want to do this kind of a crossover with the character? And I said, no, just like pure, like hardcore sword and sorcery fantasy, just like right. violent, awesome, old school. Like, cool. Cool. We'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. And I was like, okay. And then it never came around. <laughs> and then, as I was having the discussion with Conan Properties about coming back to Conan, Dynamite came to me and said, hey, no strings attached. Do you want to do Red Sonja? And I was like, I kind of do, actually. That would be a lot yeah. of fun. So I put together this um, mini series idea called Unbreakable Red Sonja. And uh, it's a real big, epic adventure. There's some really cool twists and turns in it. The first issue is out now. Second issue, I think, is coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, had an absolute blast, you know, working away with our team on it. Uh, Giovanni Valletta is the artist on it. He's doing a great job and doing some stuff that I couldn't do with Conan. And it's all in the same, you know, world, but different region. And it's been fun. So I think Dynamite's just, they were thrilled because it's like, oh, the guy who's been doing Conan for the last couple of years gets to come do this Red Sonja thing. Yeah. And then my Conan editor calls me up and he goes, you didn't tell me you're doing Sonja. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, I didn't. And he goes, that's cool. That's the appetizer before the big feast. I was like, yeah, sure, man. We're just going to have fun with it. And That's great. You know, yeah. It's been good. It's been a lot. Of yeah. Uh, we didn't really get a chance to talk too much about Thunderbolts, but Thunderbolts is still going. Thunderbolts and... is going. And what, you know, how do I put this properly? Try not to spoil anything. Yeah. You know, whenever you're doing a Thunderbolts book, people have always said, well, how do you do a twist? And no one can do the twist that, you know, Busick and, and Bagley did yeah. that. The reason why it's a classic is because it caught everyone off guard. Right. 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 And so I knew we weren't going to be able to do that kind of a thing, but issue four and five do have some really cool turns and unexpected moments. And oh, so cool. it's not anything similar to what they did, but I think, I think, you know, as much as Thunderbolts, I believe the core theme of Thunderbolts is redemption yeah. and people trying to figure out who they want to be and failing along the way. Uh, the twisty portion of Thunderbolts is also near and dear to my heart. And so we built in a pretty cool payoff that Great. is coming. And issue four is bonkers. Uh, there's some just absolutely bug nut stuff in that issue. And Sean Isaac, the stuff I asked him to draw is just, no one should ever ask an artist to do these things. And he <laughs> somehow just intrepidly carried through on the visuals and it looks amazing. Issue yeah. five is equally epic. Uh, I was literally letter proofing five last night and it's oh, just looking so, so, so good. Uh, everyone delivered their best. And I am, I'm really excited for readers to check it out because we've been getting great you know, feedback on the book. They love the way that we're doing stuff with Hawkeye and the unexpected kind of character stuff that we've been doing. And that mix of like comedy and heart that I was talking about. And, and I feel like four is just gonna, I hopefully vaulted into even more kind of discussion because yeah. 
that's where I think some of the we're laying the cards down. We've been keeping them close, and now we're going to sort of turn a little bit and show you what we got. So. Yeah, because yeah. it's funny if you look at it superficially, the story is is pretty like you know oh yeah guy's on his way on a, on a road to redemption. He wants to yeah. Yeah, you know, he, want, he needs to make this work. He needs to make this work. despite yeah, the Midlife fact, like, crisis. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Exactly. And the last issue is great because, of course, like the, the setup of, you know, who might be adding to the cast or at the very least dropping right. in for a visit. Uh, and uh, but but there's this tension underlying in the story yes. where you kind of feel like there is something else coming. Yeah, Even if there's no, stuff there's, bubbling. There's no mustache twirling silhouetted character. In a, in right. A, you know, I mean, there is a at the end of issue one, there's a creepy moment where Hawkeye's looking in the mirror and and. You're like hey, that doesn't look right. There's something freaky going on, mm -hmm. and so we we've, we've been teasing more. There's some yeah. other elements, and there's some other force at play. And the pitch of the whole kind of story was really built off of that payoff. And yeah. I think that's where we got our momentum. Was like the Ted Lasso kind of thing, but also this: Hey, we've got a a real button. We're gonna we're gonna punch on these last two. So definitely, yeah, it's gonna uh, be cool. We also got the payoff that we talked about, I think, in one of our previous episodes where you were like, I got, I, I'm getting Hawkeye back in the original costume. That was right. Three. You, you're going to, after you read issue four, I think you're going to be even more pleased on that front. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's some really fun retro stuff that we do in that issue. Uh, yeah, it was very indulgent. And I put a little bit of it in the script. And then Sean, he loves, you know, old school stuff. So, he and I were talking, he's like, more, more. And I was like, all right, I went and revised and I added a whole bunch of crazy crap in there <laughs> that he, uh, he had so much fun drawing and you can see it. You know, when, when an artist is having fun drawing a book, mm -hmm. there's something more there. There's like some extra effort. You can see it in every panel, every page, every expression, Completely. that joy comes through on the pages. And, and when you get that collaboration, right, man, whoo. Yeah. It is the best feeling in the world. I can't tell you. You open your inbox and you just have a grin from ear to ear, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Zub, if you want to uh, follow along on Jim Zub's career, you can always go to his website. Uh, yeah. Which I believe is just uh, jimzub.com. Jimzub.com. More, <laughs> more important than ever that people have websites. As right. Social, yeah. As social media uh, uh, functions shit themselves in real time, it's fantastic yeah. to to know that I have a home base. Uh, I say that to every creative person. I know that like you might be seeing tons of success on somewhere like TikTok or Instagram or, or, or YouTube or, or yeah. wherever else. But the reality is as a creative person, you should always have a home for your stuff. You should always have a, a little headquarters that you can, uh, make your own, you know, that's right. For sure. So that's right. Yeah. That's the spot where I've got obviously previews and interviews and all that kind of stuff, links to buy all my books, but also a bunch of tutorials on how to sort of make it work in comics, how, how my career started and working with artists and, and pitches and scripts and kind of all the stuff that when I was starting out, I wish I had known and yeah. try and codify as much of it as possible. So if you're an aspiring creator, if you really love these kinds of things, for the big price of zero, you can go to my website. <laughs> this is a terrible sales pitch. Uh, yeah, right. You can you can scroll down and there's like a um, a menu on the right hand bar that's just like a ton of different articles and things like that. If you like what you saw there, I do have a Patreon. It's like an archive of my scripts. I've got over 270 scripts archived at the Patreon, plus uh, Q and A's and interviews with other creators and kind of insights and things like that. So for the price of a fancy coffee, you can grab almost like, like just years worth of my writing, compare that what was written on the page to what's in the final published version. And, and that can really kind of demystify a lot of those elements. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally worth doing, uh, especially because I think that the line between like fan and creator is so blurred at this point. It's like so yeah. many people want to get in. Totally. Know, do well, but there's so many more outlets than ever before, yeah. right? Like the number of people I met at New York who were telling me, you know, they've been making books for a couple of years and they've got a Patreon or they're doing Kickstarters and these alternate sort of pathways to get yeah. your creative works out in the public square in ways that just didn't exist, you know, when I was getting started with my my own comic making. Like I made a web comic and that was already, it seemed crazy and amazing that you yep. could bypass so many of those kind of publishing hurdles and now you know we've all got professional quality desktop publishing at our fingertips and yep. and the ability to find and interact with artists and other creators around the globe you know that that alone is pretty awesome like i get yep. to work with artists 
in totally different time zones, totally different countries. And it's just like effortless. Like I'm emailing on my phone and sending them reference or they're <laughs> contacting me. I mean, it is a, it is a marvel when you think about it, you know, yeah. they, we take so much of it for granted, you know, I'm on the subway and all of a sudden I can't get a signal for 30 seconds and I get all annoyed and I'm like, wait uh -huh. a minute. <laughs> This yeah, is a we, technological marvel in exactly. my pocket, you know. Yeah. yeah, you used to have to wait weeks for like pages to come in via right? post and then <laughs> yeah. Well, the fact that, you know, I think one of the reasons why I am going off on a bit of a tangent here. I know you're shocked. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why we're all kind of in this tenuous spot right now with the social media stuff is that we have built so many relationships and friendships and outreach because of these platforms and around them. Yeah. And while we're also realizing how much of that we've come to rely on, you know what Top, I mean? Absolutely. Like you and I would not know each other without Twitter, without Facebook, without True. YouTube, right? Yeah, no. And and there are these friendships that have formed, but they're in these weird remote kind of platforms. Yeah. Uh, and other people also can control the doorways to them, which is yeah. which is wild, you know? So. Right, like if you, like Google Maps, right. you wanna get anywhere, you know, if, if, and yep. it's a free service, if Google and Google's a private company, if they just felt right. like, I don't want to do this anymore. Cause like, how or, or if they were just to... like, if you want to get to a gas station, you're going to pay 50 cents every time we guide you to a gas station. Yeah. You know? Like, or whatever you, they could Their prerogative. They could do that. Yeah. And yeah. it would be fucked and it would really like disrupt our way of life. And we'd be upset, sure. but like, we'd have nothing really to say about it, except like, that's not fair. But like, right. you know, like, what do you do? Call your congressman. And they're like, that's a private enterprise. That's like saying that like, Hey, how come this, like this bakery doesn't sell chocolate chip donut? You know what I mean? Right. Like, right. It's like, a, it's a, you know, what you hope is like, they always say, whatever the, the need of the market, someone will fill in that gap or whatever. You're like, sure. But early. Like, how much, <laughs> a, how much damage gets done along the way yeah and b you know every one of these companies will hit a certain point where they go oh we can just put our thumb on the scale and yeah. destroy our competition you know Completely. what i mean like that's oh, well, one of those at, crazy things yeah yeah look at amazon look at how yeah. uh you know it used to be like oh man if i ordered a book it got here tomorrow and now it's right. like oh I, sh I i ordered a thing and it it, it just got lost right just it's gone and because they're like well we, we killed everything like there's nothing right. there's no competition right. left. i don't have to try as hard anymore Totally, you know, and and surcharges and weird stuff at oh, the yeah. airports and all these other things. Oh, like, the airport, don't even get me started. Oh. <laughs> Getting back into travel has been a surreal experience as you're trying to figure that sort of stuff out. So it's like, yeah. you know, the technology giveth and it taketh away. Like I yeah. have such deep friendships that I've built up in these creative communities. Um, you know, my ability to talk about my work and promote my stuff. I'm sitting here on camera in my office right. talking to you remotely this is an amazing and cool thing, but it's also that weird, you got to keep that one little part of your mind where you're like, okay, just, just make sure, make sure that you have your own stuff. Make sure that yeah. you're not so reliant on any one thing. And that's yeah. true of any work for any company or any kind of creative endeavor. One of the things I'm sort of kicking myself a bit is, you know, I, I told myself I would always have a creator own book come out every single year at least mm -hmm. one issue of a creator own project and i didn't have one come out this year mm -hmm. and i'm like okay i gotta make sure i don't you know drop the ball like next year i want to have great cool you know commercial projects and and work for hire stuff and i love working in these worlds and these properties but but i gotta make my own stuff too and so that's i've right. got a new creator own book that's it's bubbling i'm really okay. excited about it i can't wait to you know get it underway but I don't want to don't want to drop that, you know, just because other opportunities are there. So right, yeah. right, that's true, that's true, and you got to keep that close to the chest until it's like actually formed. Right. Otherwise, you know. <laughs> yeah. Make your own stuff. Own your own stuff. Control your own stuff. But right, if you're working in the other people's playgrounds, have fun doing it too. So yeah, that's kind of the mandate yeah. here. Yeah, and remember, to, remember to have fun. That's the most right important thing. Like remember, to totally. Do it. Sometimes it seems As like work. It, well, it is work. It is, it is work. It is deadlines, but it's like. At the end of the day, it's still better than any other thing I would ever want to do. I love That's writing true. stories. I love collaborating with these people. Uh, I love going to conventions and meeting people, having these cool experiences. Uh, had an incredible I, how con I got to meet um, John Scalzi, uh, the, yeah. the author, and we were chatting away. And it was like I realized we had tons of mutual friends, and it was like I'm amazed we've never met each other before. And you're sort yeah. of like, this is a surreal experience that that you're part of this wider, cooler community. And that's one Absolutely. of the things why I want to do more conventions next year. Ah, yeah. Well, all the stuff. Let's go do it. Right.
Yeah, let's go do it. Thanks a lot for awesome. watching, everybody. We'll see you guys next time. And uh, by the way, all links in the description below. So check those out, and we'll see you guys later. I'm Sal. Later. Jim, so long.